There we go. Flawless. It's Is that all going well? Looks fun to buy. Cool. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for the invite to give another presentation. I do remember some of the previous occasions. They feel like a long time ago in a different different galaxy or something, <laughs> certainly a different year. Um, so, yes, yeah, so thanks for the invitation and thanks for the intro from Stephen and Scott. Um, hopefully this talk is of interest to the, the audience tonight. Um, so yes, basically it's a pipeline talk. It's based on a whole bunch of open source technologies. In particular, we're going to be having a look at um, Apache Kafka, Kafka Connect, Camel Kafka Connectors, uh, Open Distro for Elasticsearch and Kibana, and Prometheus and Grafana. So a whole um, lot of potentially interesting technologies. And, and this is the first time I've connected all of these up together in this particular way. So there's a first time for everything. Um, so I'm the technology evangelist at InstaCluster. I've been with them for about four years, coming up to four years. I'm based in Canberra, but we've got um, uh, people all, all around the world um, in the US. And we, in fact, just recently purchased a, a German uh, open source company as well. So that makes it even more international. Um, so this talk, I gave uh, a shorter version of it at ApacheCon last year and a few weeks ago at Foz Asia as well. Um, so let's get going. Um, so I, I should just say as a technology evangelist, I sort of have the freedom to experiment a bit. I'm a bit of a, a computer scientist by background, so I like playing around with technology. Um, so as we introduce new technologies to our managed service platform, I get to play with them first and try and come up with some interesting examples and build a demo. And typically I write a whole series of blogs and then give some talks about the most interesting aspects um, of the work. So this uh, this talk is based on a whole blog series that I did last year. Um, so let's get going. I can get the technology to work. Oh, there we go. So InstaCluster has a managed platform. It's sort of a complete ecosystem to support mission-critical open source big data applications. And that's sort of what it looks like. Um, but this talk was focuses on three recent additions to our managed platform, particularly Kafka Connect, uh, Elasticsearch, and Kibana. So that was a bit of an opportunity for me to actually learn those technologies from scratch as well. And pipes, uh, puzzling pipes, perhaps. This is a photo I took in Berlin at ApacheCon a couple of years ago, and I, I still actually don't quite know what they're for, but um, Berlin has all these blue pipes going around and uh, not surprisingly, someone recently suggested perhaps they were pipes for beer, which is a possibility, but I suspect not. Uh, pipes can be boring. Sometimes they're just uh, taking one thing from one place to another. Uh, pipes can be fun, of course, depending on uh, the type of pipe. In this case, uh, pipes and integration can be quite complicated and quite mission critical as well in other situations. I think this is the, the pipes uh, in a rocket engine. So I guess one of the questions I had in mind is something along the lines of, is building a robust scalable zero code data pipeline in open source a pipe dream? Hopefully not, let's find out, and no smoking. Although if you're at home, I guess you can smoke. So, um, so the idea is that it's, it's easy to build pipelines with Kafka Connect in particular. What is Kafka Connect? It's a distributed solution to integrate Kafka with other heterogeneous data sources and stores. So basically the connectors, which come in either source or sync flavors, handle the specifics of the particular integrations. Um, the source connectors um, deal with the source technology and get the data into Kafka, and the sync connectors deal with getting the data out of Kafka into whatever target system you have. So why would you use Kafka Connect? Well. In theory, it offers zero code integration, uh, high availability, and elastic scaling independent of the Kafka cluster. Um, I'm also having a look at managed Elasticsearch and Kibana. Um, Elasticsearch is for the um, scalable search of indexed documents, and Kibana is for visualization and uh, analysis of documents. Um, we provide the open distro for Elasticsearch, which is an Apache 2 license. So what's the story? Um, this talk originates from about the middle of last year. Um, I had attended a virtual Kafka summit and was quite interested in the talk put on um, 
about what the CDC in the USA had done. So within about 30 days, they had actually built from scratch a COVID-19 specific pipeline. Um, I mean, they deal with lots of different diseases and, and public health issues, but um, uh, you know, they basically had 30 days to get something working, which would integrate data from all around the US and make it available uh, to the federal agencies. Uh, some of our consultants in the US actually built an integration demo using public climate change data uh, um, via risk connectors running on Docker, sort of as a workshop thing, which I heard about, which looked sort of interesting as well. Um, so I had an idea. Could I use the streaming REST public data sources and deploy the whole system or Insta cluster on our, on our managed platform? Uh, I also wanted to look for public streaming REST APIs with easy to use JSON data format, uh, complete data, an interesting domain, and not political or apocalyptic, uh, given all the things going on in the US last year, which sort of sounded like an impossible task I'd set myself, but I finally did find something that I thought was an interesting story. Uh, did you know tides follow the lunar day? I sort of had a vague idea that tides went uh, a 24 hour period, but, uh, and this is why basically the earth moon system rotate and interact with each other uh, in a period of time, which is actually just over a 24 hour period. Uh, so that's why you get regular tides and high tides followed by low tides. Uh, and I thought, well, that's a pretty safe domain to be working in, hopefully, the physics of the world never changes and humans can't influence how the, the Earth and the Moon rotate. Perhaps a slightly naive um, understanding of tides, uh, but seemed like a sensible thing to try. Um, so the US NOAA service provides quite a lot of data and indeed um, a web portal so, so you can look at it. Um, here's an example of their tidal data that's available. Um, it's just um, for the USA, not for the rest of the world, not surprisingly. Um, and this shows where the tide data is available from. Uh, one of them in particular looked quite interesting on the north coast of Alaska. I thought I'd drill down and have a bit of a look. So if you drill down into one of the, the sites, you get a bit more information. You get a picture maybe of what's there. Um, you get some of the, the metadata about um, the type of data that's available as well. And if you drill down a bit more, you can actually see some of the data. And in fact, you can see a graph of some of the, the data, for example, water levels. Uh, and it's got an API. So that was the thing which interested me, which was relevant to my experiment. Um, it's got quite good documentation for the API, and there's quite a lot of options. And it's pretty easy to get an example REST call working um, so here's an example. You have to specify the station ID, the data type, the datum, um, which in this case was mean sea level, uh, and how much data you want. In my case, just the, the latest data point and the type of format you want the data returned in. In my case, just JSON. So there's an example of the call, and there's an example of the type of data that is returned. So you'll notice there's metadata, and there's actual data, which includes um, a timestamp and the value, which is actually the um, the number of interest that I, I wanted to get. So let's start the pipeline using this REST API for our data sources. And there's actually the sensor. They use an ultrasonic um, sensor for um, water level to measure the tide data. So what else do we need? Well, um, we need to spin up some clusters. So I did this using our managed service. Here's a screenshot of our, um, our console to provision Kafka and Kafka Connect clusters. Um, there's a whole bunch of options. You can select the cloud provider, the region, instance size, the number of uh, servers, security options, etc. And for this particular example, the slightly unusual thing is we have to tell the Kafka Connect cluster which Kafka cluster to use. Um, there's sort of a, there's a strong relationship between the Kafka Connect cluster and the, the Kafka cluster, uh, and then provision them. So we now end up with two clusters, a Kafka and a Kafka Connect cluster. And this is sort of an architecture diagram of what we're really hoping to achieve. We want to be able to get data into that cluster from some external source and eventually um, shift it into some external sync system. 
So uh, next we have to find a REST connector, deploy it to an S3 bucket, tell the connect cluster which bucket it's in, and they configure the connector and run it. Now, the reason we had to do this was that we've got this concept of a, a bring your own connector. We do provide some default connectors um, along with the Kafka Connect cluster, um, but there's no REST um, connector by default. So I had to have a bit of a hunt around and find one. And that's the process there with some of the instructions for um, getting external connectors basically into our ecosystem. Um, here's an example of the REST source connector configuration. And you've got to include details, including the connector name, the class, the URL that you're um, uh, calling, and then the topic that you want the data sent into in the Kafka cluster. So they're all highlighted. There's a few other, um, other, other fields that you need to set there as well. So it can get quite complicated. Um, and it can take some time to debug these sorts of configuration files as well. Uh, so this example polls every 10 minutes. It writes the result to the specified Kafka topic. Um, I picked five sensors just to use for the demo. So you actually need five connector instances running for it to work correctly. Um, so now we have title data coming into the Tides topic. What next? Well, next we provision the Elasticsearch and Kibana clusters. So again, we do that using our, our managed console. Um, and then we configure the default Elasticsearch connector to send data to Elasticsearch. Now we actually have one included by default, so you don't need to go through the process of um, loading it from an S3 bucket at all. It's quite straightforward to configure it and then start it running. Uh, here's the example configuration. Uh, you configure the sync connector name, the class, the index, and topic. Um, and to start with, the index is created with default mappings. Uh, and if that's just how Elasticsearch works if the index does not already exist. So great, it's all working. Well, sort of. It would be a short talk if, if that was the end of the story, I guess. Uh, the tide data is arriving successfully in the tides index in Elasticsearch. Um, but because we use default index mappings, everything is just a string. So if you want to graph them as a time series by name, then you need something called a custom mapping. So here's an example of a custom mapping. Basically, we need to be able to specify that one of the fields, T is a date, V is a double, and name is a keyword. So they're all in green in that example. And the other interesting thing about Elasticsearch is re-indexing. So every time you change an Elasticsearch index mapping, you have to delete the index and index all the data again. But where does the data come from? Well, there's two options. Um, using a Kafka sync connector, the data is actually already in the Kafka topic. So you can just replay it. So that's quite handy. Or you can use the Elasticsearch re-index operation. So the hard part is now over. And you can do something really simple, which is starting Kibana again in our managed service. You just click on the Kibana tab, and the Kibana home screen um, pops up. And then you can have a look at some data. However, there's a few steps um, to go through to visualize data. Um, initially, we have to go through three steps. We have to um, create an index pattern, which gets the data from Elasticsearch. We have to create the visualization itself to create a particular graph type, and then you have to configure the graph settings to display the data correctly. So having done all that, we end up with a graph. Um, this one has time on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, we've got an average over 30 minutes of the tide levels relative to the average level in meters for the five sample stations. So what can we see? Well. One of the perhaps the most interesting things is it does actually show the lunar day correctly, which is the 24 hour, 50 minute period that we expected. Um, so we know we are looking at tide data at that point. And we can also see something perhaps that we didn't expect, or I didn't necessarily expect, which was tidal range, which is the difference between high tide and low tide. And some of the, um, the sensors actually have quite a, a different tidal range. Um, one in particular had, had like a three minute, uh, sorry, three three meter difference between high and low tide, which is quite a lot bigger than some of the other locations. 
So it turns out that um, tidal range varies depending on a whole bunch of things, including the moon, sun, local geography, and weather. So you get parts of the world that actually have quite big tidal ranges compared to other parts. And one of these sensor locations, in fact, the one that had the big range, Nia Bay, um, is located uh, on the US coast where that arrow points to. And interestingly enough, Australia's got quite a big tidal range uh, as well located in Western Australia. So haven't we? we have tides of up to 11 meters in difference, um, which cause something called the horizontal waterfalls. I've never been there, but one day maybe I will. So I thought well, next we'd, we'd try and make a map to show the sensor locations to try and understand the tidal ranges a bit, a bit better. Uh, so here's my map. It's not very interesting, is it? There's no data on it. So and this is because there are no geo points in the data at the moment. So Elasticsearch doesn't recognize separate lat long fields as geo points. Uh, so you have to add an Elasticsearch ingest pipeline to reprocess documents before they are indexed. And of course, you need to re-index again. So there's three steps. Um, you add the geo point field, you create the Elasticsearch ingest pipeline, and then you add that as a default ingest pipeline to the index. Uh, and here are the details. So here's um, where you add a new location field with a geo point data type to the mapping and the index. Uh, this is the next step where you create a new ingest pipeline to construct the new location geo point string from the existing lat long fields. And finally, uh, you add location pipe as the default pipeline to the index. So now we have a pipeline transforming the raw data and adding the geo point location data in Elasticsearch. So next we have to create the graph. Uh, there's two steps using uh, an existing index pattern. Uh, we create the visualization and then configure the graph settings again to display the data correctly. So finally, we end up with a map. Uh, this shows the sensor locations and as an example, the minimum values of over a week period. So um, some of them are, uh, show a, a, a far bigger circle, which means that the, the value um, is, is less, basically, at this point. Uh, you can also add your own custom web map service layers. Um, that turned out to be a bit tricky, but there's an example uh, which finally worked. So this means you can bring in um, maps with uh, far higher resolution or features or different layers that um, aren't in the default base maps. Um, this one's a bit strange. You may notice that there's a big gap between um, the main part of the USA and Alaska. So they don't obviously include Canada in their, um, their map layers. So what can go wrong? Well, there's a few things that can go wrong. Uh, the first problem is the REST call can actually return JSON error messages. Uh, but the, the source connector doesn't treat this as an error. It's just JSON. So, um, so the message is still sent to the tides topic and to the elastic index. Uh, the second problem, which is probably a bit more severe, is that the REST call can also return HTTP error messages. Uh, but again, it doesn't treat these as an error. So they are descent through again. Um, the Elastic Sync connector tries to read the HTTP error message and fails to a failed state. Uh, the exceptions are then viewable in the Kafka Connect logs topic to try and work out what went wrong. So this caught me out because the system was working quite well for a few days, and then suddenly all the connectors ended up in the failed state, which I was surprised by. Um, so the Kafka Connect framework itself is pretty robust. It automatically restarts workers if they are killed, or essentially if they um, die for some random reason, but surprisingly not if they actually go into the fail state. Um, so that, that was a bit of a surprise from my perspective, because I had experimented with killing um, workers in the past, and they just pop up like whack-a-mole. So, one workaround I tried was to monitor and regularly restart the failed connectors. Um, that sort of worked okay. It was a bit of a hack. 
uh, and doing some more investigation, I found a better solution. So there is a, um, a KIP, KIP 298 called Error Handling in Connect. Uh, if the connectors actually support that KIP um, correctly, uh, then you can configure them to ignore input errors. And then the errors are sent to a dead letter topic if you've configured it um, like that. So the, the next problem I had was to find connectors with more robust error handling that actually supported that behavior. And uh, where could I go looking? Well, the Australian Outback is perhaps a slightly strange location to be looking for connectors. Um, but you do come across some interesting animals in Australia. There's kangaroos, giant guinea pig things, and oddly enough, camels. And in fact, the uh, camel solution is the one I was interested in. Um, Apache has a project called Apache Camel. And uh, oddly enough, Australia has the, the most wild camels in the world, and Apache Camel has the most Kafka connectors available, 346 of them. So Apache, Apache Camel itself is 10 years old. Uh, it's used for integration. It's got lots of components, um, enabling it to integrate things with, with other things. Um, but I was intrigued to know um, how they got so many Kafka connectors all of a sudden. So Camel meets Kafka. Uh, Camel Kafka Connector is actually a fairly new subproject um, and enables the Camel components to be used as Kafka Connect connectors. Well, how does it do that? Well, evidently they use automatic generation of the connectors from the Camel components. Um, so it automatically produces source and sync connectors depending on the actual camel components themselves. Um, there's a few things to watch out for, as I discovered. Kafka Connect configurations contain a mixture of Kafka Connect and camel configuration. So you have to read the documentation for both the camel components and the camel Kafka connector um, documentation as well. And there's a fair amount of trial and error to find all the required fields and put the correct values in to get them to work. So I took one for a test ride. Let's see what happens. Uh, here's an example of the Camel Kafka Elasticsearch Sync Connector configuration. Um, there's, a f uh, th there's one example here of a, a Camel specific thing. You have to have a, a cluster name. Uh, that's a Camel convention for endpoints. So it's got nothing really to do with um, Kafka connected. So it's a Camel thing. And it wasn't all that obvious. So you had to have it uh, for it to work. So having done that, we, we end up with a robust um, pipeline now, which handles the HTTP errors. And the connector keeps on running. So I don't need that, that hack of checking to see if they're running and restarting them. The connector itself is robust enough. However, the JSON error messages are still passed through into Elasticsearch. So I was wondering whether we could get Elasticsearch to reject the error JSON messages with um, some sort of schema validation. Um, as far as I could tell, Elasticsearch doesn't really have proper schema validation. Uh, it does have something, though, which enables you to um, turn on strict um, checking for new fields. So with dynamic um, strict, basically, it won't allow a new field such as an error field to be added to an existing um, mapping. So that seemed to work correctly. Elasticsearch now rejects the JSON error messages. Uh, but unfortunately, the connector still fails, and it can't be configured to ignore the sync errors. Uh, I had a chat to the um, Camel people about this, and it's something they're working on. So it could well have been fixed by now. I haven't tried it again. Um, but they are aware of the problem at the moment. So what do I think about the Camel Kafka Connect? Um, essentially, it provides um, slightly more robust than other open source connectors. Um, so I continue to use it. Uh, there are some other options out there, but um, I think it's because of the vast number of connectors available and the fact that they're pretty well documented and they do have the more robust error handling, it seemed like um, it was worth continuing with them. So the final thing I wanted to try with, uh, try out was scaling the pipeline. So I wanted to open the floodgates and increase the load on the system. Well, how could we increase the load? Well, 
One approach is to actually just replay the events that are already in Kafka. Uh, the second approach is to use a different um, source connector. So I discovered one called the Kafka Connect Data Gen. This is quite easy to control the load, uh, but there's no tied example. So I had to change the story from tides to stocks, but that doesn't really have an impact on the, the, the final results that I got. And the other thing we need to do is work out what to measure, because if you can start scaling uh, multiple systems like this, the metrics become more important. There are lots of systems involved and lots of possible metrics. Um, there's the source system, uh, the source connectors, um, the actual Kafka connect cluster, um, the sync connectors, the Kafka cluster itself, the Kafka topics, the Elasticsearch cluster, and the Elasticsearch index. These all have metrics associated with them. So finally, I selected seven, what I thought was hopefully um, going to be the most, most relevant metrics and collected those with Prometheus from the Insta Cluster Monitoring API. Um, so the ones I ended up with are in green there. Um, and I put them all on one Grafana dashboard because it's really helpful when you're trying to tune a pipeline like this to be able to see the, the impact of um, increasing the load on one part of the system on the system downstream. So having Grafana uh, and one single dashboard was really helpful for that. So how do we scale the pipeline? Basically, we increase the number of tasks. So to scale, we increase the load, which means more source connector tasks. And then we also need to increase the sync connect tasks to keep up. And as it turns out, you may need quite a lot more um, because of the, the difference in the performance of the systems involved. Um, what are some of the scaling goals that I had? Well, I wanted low end-to-end -end latency and for the latency not to increase, but unfortunately that wasn't a single metric. So uh, essentially I had to then keep track of the fact that the index rate was greater than the sync rate, uh, which was greater than uh, the source rate. Um, also need to watch out for the sync side scalability, which includes the sync connector and Elasticsearch. Um, also need to watch out for the fact that Kafka easily acts as a buffer, um, but the lag will actually blow out pretty quickly and take a long time to drop. So there were a few speed humps along the way. This is the first one. Uh, when I increased the load from two to three tasks, I got the same throughput. That's surprising. Um, so luckily I was actually gathering uh, per task metrics and it showed that one task had no data going through it. So essentially zero throughput. Um, so what had happened was the change to using the data gen load generator had introduced a Kafka key with only two values. So the third consumer was starved of receiving any records. Um, basically, the rule of thumb is that the number of Kafka key values should be a lot more than the number of Kafka consumers, at least 20 times greater, in my experience. So this was easy to fix. Uh, I changed the key to another field, and it scaled as expected with the blue line there. So the second speed hump um, was when I increased from three to four tasks. Again, the scalability wasn't quite what I expected. Uh, it turns out there was a problem on the elastic search side. Uh, there's a default of one shard per elastic search index, which is, in this case was far too small. So I increased that to three and we got the expected throughput. So finally, if you want to build your own pipeline, what should you watch out for? Well, first of all, you have to find a connector. You can buy them. Um, you can acquire an open source one or even write your own. Then you've got to work out how to configure it. Uh, configurations are typically different. There's lots of trial and error, lots of failures, and hopefully it eventually it runs. Uh, transformation of the data on the sync side may also be required. Then you really should test it out, introduce source sync and other errors to check if it's robust enough, because you really want a pipeline to run continuously once you set it up without any human intervention. Uh, you want to monitor and scale it and watch out for unexpected failures, uh, lag, 
slow sync systems, which can require more sync tasks, but that requires more Kafka partitions, which actually reduces the Kafka throughput. So there's a bit of a, a balance there. And again, check on the capacity of the sync systems and make sure you've got sufficient capacity to cope with the, um, the data going into them. Uh, you can test all this out on our, um, our managed service. We've got a trial available, so you can just spin up some of these clusters yourself and test things out. And that's the end of the talk. Thank you very much. Um, so the details uh, are in my, my link there, which has all my blog series. Um, there's a five-part pipeline blog series if you search for that. And the last one of those series actually has the link to the GitHub where I put the example configuration files being code free. There's no, no code for this particular one. Um, so that'll give you a starting point though, if you wanted to try this out and tinker with things at all. So that's all from me. Thanks very much. I hope that was interesting. And what should I do at my end? Stop the screen share? No, no, no just leave it up there. Oh, I'll just leave it there. Okay. Yes, cool. you can st stare at it like adoringly. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll probably get some weird after image. Sure. Thank, thank you very much, Paul, for that. Um, there's so much to take in. For, first question first, there's so much nutritious goodness in there. <laughs> I'm pushing the friendship to ask if you guys are okay to, uh, to share the slide deck for this one. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, that's fine. Yep, it's quite big. That's the one on the downside. Excellent. So what, like 50 bucks or something, and you're on the usual 10% or something? Or? Yeah. Yeah, it's about 70 megabytes, I think. So. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So I, I don't really have, in fact, we, there's another question that's, that's just popped in, which was mm -hmm. sort of kind of similar to the one I was about to ask. So Ka Kafka is obviously at the center of the, you know, the managed service and the solution that you're talking about here. So for newbies that are just learning how to drive it, mm -hmm. what, what advice would you give them to run run at 100 kilometers an hour in the opposite direction? Or you know, how can you really get to grips with how to drive Kafka? Um, yeah, I did it just by building a few demo examples. And so I, I learned by uh, making lots of mistakes, to be honest. And um, if you don't want to have to repeat that process yourself, you can read about my mistakes. So again, with that link that I've got here, some of the earlier blog series were on, on Kafka, just, just Kafka itself with no complications with other systems involved. Um, so I actually built a system called Congo, which is a, um, a sort of a lo logistics um, environment with trucks and goods and warehouses and things all moving around using Kafka. So that's that's a pretty good starting point. That's where I started. Um, and quite a lot of the discoveries I made from that project have been um, condensed into other blogs as well, um, which are a bit more focused on how you can scale Kafka and things. Um, so we did, did another one, which is an anomaly detection system, which um, used Cassandra as well. So it was sort of a dual, dual technology solution. And we managed to get up to, I think it was 19 billion anomaly checks a day with quite big clusters for those. That's a good example of quite a, a big scalable Kafka system. Um, another one that I'd recommend is um, a sort of a one-off presentation I don't know. I don't really have the link at the moment, but if you search for um, Visual Kafka Introduction on our website, you'll find a, sort of a, a bit of a comic strip style introduction to Kafka. That's pretty high level, but it's got enough detail there to get get you going um, with Kafka. I think Kafka is relatively simple. I mean, it's, it's just a streaming system. It just um, you put data into it and pull data out of it. Um, so at some level, it's pretty easy to start start using. It's one mm. of those things I'm sure because you guys obviously are uh, you know, considered sort of experts in the Cassandra field as a managed service as well. I'm, I'm sure, mm. like it, it's one of those things with Kafka. You can start off, you know, with a Docker image, and you might be fooled into thinking that you're, you know, that you're an expert, and you should get it up on LinkedIn. But you soon find out that as you start to scale, that um, yep. you're offering becomes more attractive. <laughs> mm, yep, no, the scalability side is certainly um, becomes trickier, I guess, the bigger the systems. I mean, it's, one of the advantages of these open source technologies is it's really easy just to spin up um, a small cluster on your laptop or something as well and, and 
get a get a, a feel for it and get some some code working yourself. But yes, as soon as you want to try and scale it, uh, then it's certainly ha helpful having the managed service aspect. I, I wouldn't have liked to have set up some of these systems without it, to be honest. So the the one that we had the 19 billion checks a day had like a thousand cores or something eventually involved and quite a lot of complexity around the monitoring and stuff. So it's, it was nice not to have to worry about that at all. So it's, it's it's enough just to worry about getting your application working without worrying about how you scale the infrastructure as well. So. Thousand cores, that must have been, you know, your Mac must have been working pretty hard. That. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> mm. uh, yeah, Scott, Scott, how are things with you? Have you got any questions at all? Yeah, I've got a couple on the site. Uh, thanks for that talk, Paul. Very informative, mate. That's right. Um, Hopefully it made sense. Yeah, it sort of, I, I still keep thinking about the um, the picture with the, the beer pipelines in, uh, in Germany. Like, I, I didn't really get past that. It's just like, ooh, I wonder where the beer flows to. <laughs> there are actually beer pipelines. I mean, I looked it up there. Um, Yeah, there are some, there's a famous brewery or something that had to install one because the, their road wasn't at, up to sufficient capacity to transport the beer by truck so they just put it a pipeline directly in somewhere but i don't think it was blue so mm. oh man that would be phenomenal hey um just a couple of questions here mm -hmm. so one is around um did you get this these services um up and running on gcp or azure or is it just uh, well products? in theory we could so yes we um we're not fussy about um the cloud provider so yeah this was all on aws but that was um, just because that was the default at the time that I was I was trying, but yeah, they will run on just about any other cloud provider you can think of. So, yeah. Nice. And uh, there's one around the sharding considerations, but yeah, sort of touched mm -hmm. on that again at the end. So, if you're going to do this again, would you just go with a, a three sharding solution for Elastic? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I'm not an Elastic Search expert, so I, I did have a chat about this with our Elastic Search gurus and. Yeah, again, it, uh, typically with these cluster-based solutions, they all are slightly different, and the Elasticsearch scalability um, requires a bit of thinking, haven't we, about, about the right number of um, shards and things like that. So, um, yeah, typically the, the answer is you have to benchmark your actual application <laughs> um, and not just accept the defaults and things. So, okay. yeah. Cool. And um, just one from me, like, I was just sort of wondering when you were mentioning sort of Kafka Connect, did you look at sort of EKS or Elastic's Kubernetes sort of offering at all when you guys were, were looking at deploying this out? Or do you do you um, Not for this particular project. I've actually used um, uh, EKS before for the anomaly detection system, I think. So that had quite a lot of resources on the, the client side. Um, which needed um, needed to be elastic and scalable, so I did use X for that, and that worked pretty well. Uh, and again, it would work. I think it would work fine for this type of system as well. Um, well, yeah. Having said that, we're not the the. I guess the advantage of using Kafka Connect um, is that you don't really have to deploy any code yourself anywhere. Um, I mean, another approach to what I did is to use Kafka Streams, but then you'd have to run the stream code on something like Kubernetes or something, which would, would also work fine as well. And I, in, in reality, I did encounter some of the limitations just using sort of a zero code approach for Kafka Connect. And the existing connectors just aren't really designed for flexible transformations and things that you might really want in practice. Um, so Kafka Streams certainly would be the, the right answer there. And yeah, running it on Kubernetes would would work pretty well. So. Okay, thanks. No need to come back and give us a slightly tailored talk and tell us how you know tell us some Kubernetes magic. Uh, uh, that means up. <laughs> yeah, I have been meaning to. Um, I've got another project on the ball at the moment, which is sort of a, a globally distributed stockbroker application deployed in multiple locations around the world. Uh, for low latency and for redundancy. And I've been thinking about using something like Istio or something as sort of the application level framework for that. So, but I'm only about halfway through that. So I haven't quite got to the point where I've got some results yet. So, your name, yeah, your name, a few months. Your name is on my list. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that'll be good motivation to keep, um, 
keep going with that one. Yeah, exactly. So you mentioned obviously that was uh, ca the ca camel camel flavored Kafka connectors for everybody's yes. alliteration. Mm. Try any, <laughs> Very uh, any others, and you know, was there any cl close contenders, or are they all sort of very much poor second cousin? Ah, uh, yeah. So that's a, that's a good that's a good question. Um, in terms of the sheer number of Kafka connectors, I don't think anyone else is even <laughs> in the same ballpark at all. Some of the, I mean, some of the commercial offerings maybe have twenty or thirty connectors, but certainly not hundreds. So I mean, the the clever thing about the camel stuff is that it's all auto generated. So if if a camel component exists, then a, a Kafka component or Kafka connector will also exist magically for it if it makes sense. Um, I did try some of the other camel um, Kafka connectors. For example, the obvious one to try it was their Cassandra one. Um, but unfortunately, I couldn't actually crack the configuration puzzle for that. Um, the configuration was just a bit too hard for me to get, get working. Um, and it wasn't really core for this project. So I, I sort of gave up perhaps a bit prematurely. But um, there's, a, there's the lenses ones that we provide, I think, um, by default. So the default Elasticsearch one in our environment was the, the lenses connector, um, which again, it's open source, but it is slightly tricky to configure as it does assume that it's running in their environment um, to some extent. So it wasn't, it wasn't perfect, it did work okay. Um, that didn't really have that sort of the robust error handling that I wanted. Nice. A couple um, more questions in as well. Yeah, fire away, Scott. Um, is it possible to have data quality check in the connector? Hmm, okay, so essentially doing things like checking if there's an error message coming in and actually rejecting it at that point, at the point of entry or something. Yeah, I had wondered about that. Um, not that I could work out. I mean, you could write your own connector that, that could do that. That's certainly one possibility. Um, but yeah, I haven't come across an example where you can actually just configure it off the shelf to, to reject um, messages that don't fit into the particular format or whatever. Um, Somebody in the audience has got any ideas. You can just pop, pop down some suggestions in chat, perhaps. Sorry for interrupting, Paul. Mm, that's right. So another question there, Scott? We have indeed. Um, what's the impact on processing by sync when adding shards to the cluster? Um, hmm. So this is talking about adding shards on the Elasticsearch side, perhaps, or? So it yeah. seems to be, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess, so one of, the, one of the slight problems of scaling a system that's got heterogeneous technologies like this is the, the, the scalability is quite different for each of the technologies. Um, and yeah, as you scale, scale up, um, you've got to take into account different things with the different systems. So I guess one of the, on the Kafka side, one of the, the problems of Kafka scalability is as you increase the number of Kafka consumers, which um, in the connected world are sinks, you actually have to increase the number of petitions. But as you increase the number of petitions in Kafka, because of the replication overhead, you actually get less throughput eventually. So, so you have to increase the petitions to get more throughput, but at some point you actually do need a bigger cluster with more powerful um, nodes and more nodes to get um, the throughput that you want. So that's one of the implications on the Kafka side. Um, I'm not an Elasticsearch guru, but I certainly did find that there was a... Elasticsearch was really quite slow compared to Kafka. Um, so I think I was hitting it um, about 70 uh, indexes a second per um, sync task. Um, so that's pretty slow in Kafka terms. Normally you can get thousands of events uh, through a Kafka consumer really easily. Um, but 70 into Elasticsearch was the bottleneck there. So I had to increase the number of um, number of sync threads. Uh, so yeah, it's all a bit of a balancing act, I guess, is, is the overall message at that point. Mm. That makes sense. 
Thanks for that. Cool. I've just got one one last question there, Paul. Um, this is all about sort of tidal flow that we're detecting here. I'm just wondering if you didn't give me a call when my house was going under in the hot. <laughs> yes. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, it was perhaps a bad at the time I thought it was uh, a safe example to pick, um, but there were actually some quite nasty storms in the US and around even around the world last year um, that, of course, were examples of uh, tidal impacts on uh, the coastline and we're not things. So, um, yeah, I didn't really manage to escape the whole apocalyptic story. <laughs> yeah.